and show up my shirt. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and start out. Just go ahead and state your name and where you're from, and, and we'll go from there. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Wells, and I live in Aspen, Colorado, and I'm here at the Transplant Games as with Team Rocky Mountain. Excellent. Why don't you start at the beginning and tell us your transplant story, if you don't mind. Well, back in about nine, eight, 1992, my stomach grew up like a basketball. I mean, I know what a, nine, what a pregnant woman feels like. Mm -hmm. So I went to the hospital and they diagnosed me with hepatitis C and cirrhosis of the liver. So I, uh, at that time, they didn't really have a viable treatment for hepatitis C. So we couldn't really do much about it. So I, what I did was uh, just live for a while, and then um, something happened to me, and I, so, you know, I just was getting sicker. So I went to my doctor and said, "Hey, we need to try a treatment program or see if we can find a program or something to get on." Well, they sent all my uh, medical records to the University of Washington in Seattle, and about a month later, they sent back and said, "You need a transplant." there's no way we can help you. And I said, oh, do I want to get a transplant? I asked myself and I said, well, yeah, if I want to live, I got to go get one. Mm -hmm. So I went through their program of getting uh, accepted. It took about six months to go through all the medical process. And um, so I was accepted. And actually, when I first went to the hospital, I walked in the hospital and something told me, you're going to get the transplant and you're going to be accepted on the list. Nice. And I knew it. And from that moment on, for that whole time, waiting for the transplant, my mantra was positive thought breeds positive action. Mm -hmm. So Excellent. that's what I did. So I got trans, you know, I had to wait for it, you know, from the time I was diagnosed to about 19, I got on the list in 1996. And I got transplanted December 2nd, 1999. I was on a really low on the list when they first told me I, two to three years transplant to wait. So I, um, I said, well, that's going to be a long time. And But one day I was uh, driving my car and I felt really drunk. Uh -huh. And I hadn't drank it for a while, <laughs> a long time, a couple of years or so. Yeah. But I felt like I was drunk. So I went back to my house and called the hospital and told them. And they said, come down here and we need to test you. So they brought me, and this was after about being on everything for about a year and a half. Uh -huh. And they um, took me down and they'd do this number test, random numbers on a paid piece of paper from 1 to 36, and you just go 1, 2, 3, 4, but you, you know, you've got to zigzag around and stuff. And you should just be able to flow right through. Right. Well, the first time I did the test, when they first gave it to me, I probably did it in about 20 seconds. This time it took me a minute. Mm -hmm. to do the test because I just couldn't really because yeah. I was starting to get sicker with the uh, cirrhosis and the hep C oh, interesting. and you know what happens with cirrhosis is your liver scars and your liver actually cleanses the toxic chemicals out of your body and one of the toxic chemicals is ammonia mm -hmm. and it wasn't doing a good job of cleansing that and was sending back to my brain so I couldn't think clearly and that's why I felt drunk when I was driving wow. So they put me on list, I was actually on list three and they moved me right up to list one. Okay. After the, all the te that test and the, my blood test, they moved me up to list one. That was in, um, I believe, uh, September 1999. Mm -hmm. And then uh, two months later, I get a call saying, hey, you want to come and be a second? And I said, sure, I'll come down and be a second. You know, that means you're waiting to see, make sure they bring a second in because they want to make sure they can use the organ. But if the person accepted who's first is not a, can't take the transplant because they're sick or something's yeah, happening to can. them, yeah. I get the transplant. And I said, yeah, I'll come down. That was uh, a Monday. And um, well, they brought me in, took out test tubes about yay big, took out about 11 test tubes of blood. Mm -hmm. And um, I got a room and everything, and I'm thinking, wow, you're going to get transplanted, man. I'm <laughs> thinking, oh, this is interesting. You know, I'm, I was always pretty positive I was going to get the transplant. I have a common blood type, so that really helps out. Okay. And, um, you know, so they came in and gave me an enema. Uh -huh. You know, and I said, well, that's exciting. I've never <laughs> had one before. So I get that all done. And about 20 minutes after I did the enema, they came in and said, well, Mr. Wells, 
they started the transplant, you can go home now. Oh, yeah. And I just said, hey, thanks for the clean out. <laughs> yeah. So I went home, and that was Monday night. And so I could do a little work the next day. And that night, they called me again to see if I wanted to be a second. And you kind of have to follow their protocols. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, I'll come down. This time, they just left me out in the out in the um, waiting room. Yeah. I didn't get a room or anything. And I just sat around for about four or five hours waiting to see for the transplant. And I think they actually forgot me because I couldn't eat any food. All I could do was sip on water. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't eat, and um, I, they forgot about me a little bit. So I went and had to go talk to them, and they said, oh, they haven't started the transplant. They're not sure yet. You need to wait a little while longer. So at about 5 in the afternoon, I go back in again. I've been there since like 8 o'clock in the morning, uh -huh. 8 or 9 in the morning. And um, they call me, and um, we go in there, and they said, oh, at 5 o'clock, I go talk to them. Oh, we started the transplant. I said, well, how come someone didn't come and try and find me? Right. You know, did right. you forget about me? Obviously, they did. Mm -hmm. So um, that was actually a th um, Thursday evening okay. of that week. See, Monday I went down, came back. They called me Wednesday to come in and the next day. So Thursday, that was Thursday evening. and um, But they did tell me I was number one on the list when I left. And I said, well, that's good. You know, mm -hmm. but I wasn't really thinking anything about it. There were two in one week then. Right and now. then I get home to my house, and at these t at this day and age, 1999, they gave you a beeper. Yeah. I didn't have a cell phone or anything. I, you know, the cell phones were in their infancy back then. Right. So um, I'm walking up the stairs to my house, and my phone ring is ringing in my house, and the thought of my head is, what the uh, you know, phone harassment person is calling me? You know. Who's, mm -hmm. Who's calling me? You know, right. what is this? You know, and I'm thinking, I don't want to deal with this. So I pick it up and they go, Mr. Wells, we have a liver for you. You need to come right back. <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, I don't know if I can drive. I lived in a place called Bellingham, Washington, mm -hmm. and I had to go to Seattle, which is 80 miles away. And I'm thinking, man, I'm pretty tired. I haven't eaten very much this week. And I said, well, I'll be there. So I had to call my brother and say, hey, man, you need to be at the hospital at 630 in the morning to put me under. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I hopped in the shower, took my shower, um, and headed on down to the, you know, took my time driving down there. Yep. I just had to be there at, at 6 in the morning. I get in there, they get me all prepped up for everything. And I'm thinking, man, it's like 6.40, and they haven't quite put me under yet, and my brother's not here. <laughs> I'm going, gee whiz. So he shows up right as they were giving me the anesthesia and stuff, yeah. or anesthesia, I mean. Yeah. And so they put me under. Um, they told me I was on the operating table for 13 and a half hours. And uh, this happened December 2nd, 1999. And 18 and a half years later, I'm still here. I've nice. never really had a problem. I don't take very much medication. So, so recovery was was my uh, recovery in my fifth, the, the actual process of recovery for me physically was a while I just you know I wasn't in the best of shape so that's still you know that's a while mm -hmm. it took a while uh, but the transplant itself has actually been really good the only thing that at that time they left a bile tube in you mm -hmm. for to right. drain just right. in case they had to well when they took that out the bile tube in my body didn't heal and it was leaking into my stomach cavity mm -hmm. It was extremely painful. I mean, oh, I could. That's probably the most painful I've ever had. Yeah. So they immediately shot me up with some morphine. Oh. And they said, "How's that doing?" And Fifteen minutes later, I said, "I need more, man. That's not yeah. doing anything." So oh, they did, hit, did me one more time, and that really helped out. So they um, had to put a stent in. Okay. This is about three months after my transplant. Mm -hmm. Had to put a stent in, so I. Um, and when they did that, they bumped my pancreas, which is a no-no. Oh, no, yeah. So I couldn't eat. You know, they kept me in the hospital for a week. I couldn't eat for three days because they didn't want the pancreas secreting any juices or any, you know, the enzymes and stuff that helps you break down your food. So. Wow. So um, tell me what your thoughts are about your, uh, do you know anything about your donor at all? Uh, I know my donor. Uh, my doctor came in, Dr. Bob Levy name was 
or is still. He um, came in and told me that it was a 19-year-old male, and I got a very good liver uh -huh. and treat it right. Yeah, good. Any thoughts you have about that? So I've done that ever since. About that right. donor and. Uh, I think about him every day because I don't know. I sent him two letters uh, about three and four years out of my transplant, but uh, they told me they were undeliverable. Mm. You know, they couldn't deliver them. It wasn't that they didn't, that people didn't want to meet me or something. They right. just couldn't deliver the letters for some reason. I don't know. So I really haven't made an opportunity to contact them again, which probably is, that's my fault. Well, you know, I understand. I, I think about them every day. I usually try and say thank you every night when, before I go to bed because mm -hmm. that's why I'm here. You know, I've had you know my ups and downs after transplants. You know, one thing that people think about transplants is that everything's going to be hunky dory. Well, that's not the case. But uh, the way I look at it, I get to feel life's aches and pains and the good stuff too. Like I went to, um, I've been to uh, Australia. New Zealand, Sweden, Spain because of the transplants. Wow. World Transplant Games were there. Mm -hmm. I've also climbed, hiked up to the crater of Mount St. Helens. Wow. I've hiked up Aspen Mountain. I've done skiing. You know, I've got to do a lot because I'm still alive. Right. You know, Absolutely. I also broke this arm, got a new hip. <laughs> so you get you get the pain and the aches along with it. You know, it's, it's part of being normal alive. life. Yeah. It's part of being alive. You know, yeah. feeling you know feeling alive. The games themselves. That's there are such an amazing experience. I would recommend anybody involved in the transplant community in any shape, manner, or form to come and attend the games to see what, how valuable their work is. So. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I was going to ask you next about what you thought of the games, and you already went there, so I um, can't really think of anything else. Um, this is starting to jump around a little bit. I don't know why. Anyway, any other closing thoughts, or you want to just wrap it up? Live life, give life. Excellent.